Hi there, this is Mr. Wells, and in today's video we will be discussing the layers of Earth's atmosphere. We know that Earth's atmosphere is a protective envelope above the surface of the Earth. It allows us to breathe and it protects us from harmful solar radiation. For billions of years, this has allowed organisms to evolve and thrive on the planet. We wouldn't exist ourselves without the atmosphere. Now when you look at the atmosphere from the surface, I'll pull up a picture. Uh, imagine we're walking through a field. We look up in the sky on a normal sunny day. Uh, what, were, what would be some of the things that you would see? You'd probably see the blue skies, the clouds, uh, maybe an airplane or two, something on that order. However, Earth's atmosphere is a complex and layered system with each layer serving its own important function. Uh, back to the image up on the front here. This image was taken by the International Space Station. Uh, and here you can actually see the individual layers of Earth's atmosphere. In this video, we're going to be breaking these down individually. So let's get started. Here on this slide, we have a diagram of the four major layers of Earth's atmosphere. The troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. We're going to reference this diagram each time we talk about an individual layer. It's an important figure because it contains a lot of useful information. Uh, for example, on the right here, we're going to see this bar that goes from the surface all the way up to the top. And this is actually our altitude. And so we have a kilometer side and a mile side. So when we're looking at this, I'm going to reference kilometers. So just make note of that. Uh, but you can look at miles too. You'll be able to get a good breakdown of that. And then on the far right here, this red line, we have a temperature gauge, essentially. And so we've got this x-axis that describes temperature, and you can see that the temperature changes with altitude. So that would be the big relationship to look at is that you have temperature along this gradient, and this will correlate with our altitude as well. So for example, with the troposphere, you can see the temperature is going down as you go up in altitude. In this video, we're going to be working our way from bottom to top. So you can imagine that, let's say we're starting a rocket launch here in the troposphere. We're gonna work our way all the way up to the thermosphere. So we're gonna cover each layer. Imagine that we're in sort of like a rocket that's just launched in the troposphere. We're gonna go bottom to top. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about the troposphere, which is the bottom layer. So the troposphere starts at zero kilometers, which we're gonna call Earth's surface. And that's gonna go up to about 10 kilometers or a little bit over six miles. The layers of the atmosphere can primarily be broken down by their changes in temperature and air density. So we've got, I'm gonna, for each layer, we're gonna have a section where we talk about temperature and air density, and I'm gonna describe if it goes up or down, basically. And so uh, we could probably take a guess as to air density. Due to the laws of gravity, most air molecules are gonna be concentrated closer to the surface. So that means that as you go up in altitude, you're gonna have a lower concentration of air molecules, which means your air density is gonna be lower as you go higher in the troposphere. Interestingly enough, this will be true for all of the layers. So the air density is gonna be one that's gonna be easy to fill in because it's gonna go down as we constantly go up in altitude. Uh, temperature is gonna be the unique case, although temperature in the troposphere is pretty simple to understand. Our heat source is at the ground, and so as you go up in altitude, as we go away from that heat source, it's gonna get colder. You might actually know this because if you've ever flown in an airplane, airplanes like to fly in the upper troposphere or the lower stratosphere. Um, and so you're going to be right here at this boundary, which we would call the tropopause. And so, and there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you've ever been in an airplane and they've pulled up the temperature gauge as you're really high up in altitude, you know that the temperature gets really, really, really low. Um, that relationship is actually going to change as we go up uh, in altitude. But in the troposphere, it's pretty much a straight correlation where as you go up, temperature is going to go down. There's some nuance with that. We can have temperature inversions, which we'll talk about in the future. Um, but for now, that's what you need to understand with the troposphere is that air density is going to go down and temperature is going to go down as well. Uh, the troposphere, because it contains most uh, of the air molecules, contains a lot of the heavier stuff. Uh, I, the troposphere actually contains 99% of the water vapor on the planet, which is why the troposphere is the layer where all weather occurs. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple pictures in a second here. Actually, I'll pull those up right now. Um, so when you see like a big thunderstorm here, the, all of that air mass, those cumulonimbus clouds are forming and topping out at the top of the uh, troposphere. And so all weather, because most of the water vapors in the troposphere, all weather occurs in the troposphere as well. Uh, this image here I chose because you can kind of see that tropopause. You can see the boundary between the troposphere and the next layer, the stratosphere. Um, some people like to think that Mount Everest, like you're getting up into the upper layers of the atmosphere when you summit Mount Everest. But actually, ironically, the, even the peak of Mount Everest um, is still uh, pretty well in the, the troposphere. So that's some examples of what it looks like to be in the troposphere, which uh, should make sense because we live in the troposphere. 
All right, our imaginary shuttle has now left the troposphere behind and we've entered the next highest layer in the atmosphere, which is the stratosphere. And so the stratosphere is about 40 kilometers thick. Uh, it goes from about 10 kilometers above Earth's surface to about 50. And as you go higher in the stratosphere, air density is of course gonna go down. Uh, that's true for all the layers in general. What's gonna happen is that your air density is gonna go down. But what, dis what makes the stratosphere distinct from the troposphere is the fact that temperature actually goes up. That might not seem conceptually, uh, you know, it might be nonsensical when you think about it at first, because you would think logically that as you go up in altitude, temperature is going to decrease. So why is it that in the stratosphere, why is it the temperature goes up as you go up in altitude? Um, and the reason for that is actually the defining characteristic of the stratosphere, which is its high concentration of a molecule known as ozone, ozone chemical formula O3. So I'm, gonna, I'm about to say a lot of O's, so hopefully we can follow along. But the reason that the temperature goes up uh, as a result of the ozone layer is that ozone is formed through a process in which ultraviolet radiation from the sun can actually break down molecules like O2. And so you have an O2 molecule, you break it down to form a couple oxygen atoms, just chemical formula O. And what happens is those, those free oxygen atoms will combine with other O2 molecules to form that O3. So you have O2 plus O is O3. Uh, you've now formed uh, an ozone molecule. What's fascinating is that that ultraviolet radiation that was beaming down from the sun that caused that initial breakdown, when it interacts with those oxygen molecules, is going to form heat. So one of the byproducts of that reaction is just heat. And so that heat that's generated in the ozone layer is actually what causes the stratosphere itself to become hotter as you go up in altitude. And this is a pretty incredible process, not just the fact that it happens in the atmosphere, but the fact that that ultraviolet radiation, that if it wasn't for the ozone layer, would hit the surface, could cause severe damage to organisms. It could have stymied evolution. Uh, and so it's, it's actually a really incredible thing for life on Earth. It might not be possible to have life on Earth if we didn't have a protective ozone layer. And then just coincidentally, that, that reaction causes the temperature to go up in the stratosphere. Um, so that's really fascinating. I'll talk more about that on the next slide as well. So the boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere is something that you can actually see yourself. Uh, I've got a couple images that I pulled up here um, where you can actually see that boundary. So really high level clouds can kind of kind of tend to settle out right at that boundary of the troposphere and stratosphere, which we call the tropopause. So you're not really gonna get any cloud formation in the stratosphere, which is actually why commercial airliners like to fly in the lower part of the stratosphere because you're not gonna have as much air turbulence if you don't have all that water vapor and excess gas. Um, and so it's something that visibly, if you've ever flown in like a commercial airliner, you could actually see that. Well, you see this blanket of clouds. You're actually observing the upper limits of the troposphere stratospheric boundary. Um, and then when you look at a picture like this, I said I was gonna refer back to the ozone hole. Um, so here's the thing about ozone. If it, ozone is, uh, if enough ozone is being created as being destroyed, what's going to happen is that the ozone layer is just going to maintain a sort of equilibrium or stasis, um, and that'll continue to protect us from harmful ultraviolet radiation. However, back in the 1970s, we discovered that uh, a human-produced compound called chlorofluorocarbons, um, which are a component in things like aerosols, uh, refrigerants, so thinking like hairsprays and refrigerants back in the day, um, those CFCs actively broke down ozone in the stratosphere. Uh, another complex molecular interaction between the CFCs and the ozone. But the takeaway is that when you break down that ozone and you don't have enough uh, ozone being formed to repair that, you're going to create a weakening, a softening in the ozone layer, um, which we can see pretty strongly in the poles. And so what, we are, what you're actually seeing here is, uh, and this is pretty modern day data, you're seeing this ozone hole, which still exists today. But luckily, the good news is that major nations uh, since then have banned the production of chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, the problem is that gases have a pretty long residence time in the atmosphere. And so the, there's, we're still seeing the damage from those CFCs uh, still today. But the good news is that the ozone hole has been repairing itself uh, since we've ceased production of CFCs. Um, so it's something that, and it, this is actually interesting, like you could look at the, the sprays, sprays in your uh, you know, kitchen cabinet, or if you work at a restaurant, or uh, if you use hairspray or anything like that, you can actually see um, on the bottle, it'll be labeled like non-CFC because we've actually, as a society, banned chlorofluorocarbons um, uh, to prevent those from being released in the atmosphere. Over time, 
the the ban has led to a repairing of the ozone hole. We think like by the 50s, 60s, or 70s, 2050s, 60s, or 70s, uh, that hole will be repaired, uh, essentially. Okay, so we finally left the stratosphere and we're now entering the next layer of our journey, which is the mesosphere. Um, that's gonna be between 50 and 85 kilometers. Uh, the mesosphere is pretty simple when we're thinking about our, our basic interactions between temperature and air density. Air density is of course gonna go down and much like the troposphere, uh, temperature is also gonna go down too. And really uh, an explainer on that would be pretty similar to the troposphere itself. So we know that the heat source in the troposphere is the ground surface. And it makes sense that as you remove yourself from that heat source, as you go up in altitude, um, you're gonna get diminishing returns, temperature's gonna go down. Uh, we know that in the stratosphere, temperatures go back up. And so what actually marks the boundary between the stratosphere and the mesosphere is where you're no longer really feeling the effect of warming from the stratosphere, from the ozone layer in the stratosphere. And so as you get up into this area, you're gonna start to see temperatures decrease again with altitude. That's how you know that you're in the mesosphere. Uh, the mesosphere is a pretty simple layer. Um, gas is pretty minuscule, uh, but it is enough to generate friction. And that's gonna be important for our next slide. So the fact that the mesosphere is still dense enough to produce significant friction means that objects like meteors, which you see on the left here, as they enter our atmosphere from above, they'll start to burn up in the mesosphere. So the mesosphere is where you're gonna to start to see like the formation of a shooting star, for example, and you might've seen that uh, on your own. Something you might not have seen is the image on the right here. Um, the mesosphere can also contain some eerie looking clouds, which we said clouds mostly form down here in the, and you can actually see this down here in the troposphere. Um, but the mesosphere can form these kind of like, uh, uh, kind of ghostly clouds that are made up of mostly uh, ice crystals. They're really difficult to see. You kind of have to be in polar regions during astronomical twilight. Uh, but it's a cool phenomenon that occurs. It's exclusively in the mesosphere. Okay, finally we arrive at the uppermost layer of the atmosphere. We've left the mesosphere and we're on our last leg of the journey, which is the thermosphere. This layer is unique as it marks the transition between Earth's atmosphere and what we would actually call outer space. I have that cut off right here at the top, so the thermosphere clearly goes above this line, but this is the boundary between the Earth and space, essentially. Um, the actual thermosphere itself goes from 85 to 1,000 kilometers. So it's, it's a tremendously large layer. Uh, a lot goes on there for how little there actually is in the layer itself. Um, in the thermosphere, as you go higher, air density is, of course, going to go down. That should make sense because that's been continuous from our, our, you know, the beginning of our journey down in the troposphere. But also, it should make even more sense in this case because we're actually entering space, which is a true vacuum. Um, the interesting thing about the thermosphere, though, is that temperature actually goes up. And you're gonna have to follow me, uh, you're gonna have to follow with me on this one because this is a little bit tricky. Um, so what happens here in this case is that atoms of nitrogen and oxygen in the thermosphere are gonna absorb really high levels of high energy solar radiation. Uh, you can almost think of this like the ozone process that we saw in the stratosphere. It's different obviously, uh, but you can think of that, that conversion of solar radiation into heat and energy kind of in the same vein. Uh, when this occurs, the radiation that's converted into heat and energy is actually going to heat the thermosphere up to temperatures of, and this is hard to believe, but 2,000 degrees. However, interestingly enough, you wouldn't really feel hot going through the thermosphere. Um, that's possible because when you think about it, heat is transferred to an object through molecular interactions or collisions. Um, so when you have so few air molecules like you do in the thermosphere, again, remember the mesosphere had very little, but you were, you were having enough to generate friction. That's not the case in the thermosphere. Um, so with so few air molecules in the thermosphere, there just isn't enough potential for molecular collisions to actually transfer significant quantities of heat into another object. That's why you can have those thermal temperatures that are so high, and yet if you were traveling through the thermosphere, you wouldn't actually feel uh, hot. Um, it's a really fascinating uh, line of thought. We'll talk about that more for sure in a future video. We define the boundary between Earth and space as the Kármán line, and that ex that's, that's right here in our diagram, right up at the very top, uh, 1,000 kilometers above the surface. Um, the International Space Station is in the thermosphere. Um, it's about 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, so well above the Kármán line, but still in the boundary, this 1,000 kilometer boundary of the thermosphere. But at that point, you're actually considered to be in orbit, low Earth orbit, uh, which most people consider to be outer space. So you might have seen pictures like uh, the ones that you see here 
you might even be lucky enough that you've actually seen this firsthand. If you don't know what these are, these are auroras, which are these beautiful light shows that you get um, in the upper part of the thermosphere. These aurora are a result of charged particles from the solar wind, which travel down magnetic field lines in the Earth, and they interact with molecules like oxygen and nitrogen in the thermosphere, causing them to become excited. This is that same process we were talking about uh, in the last slide. This process causes the molecules to also give off photons of light. Uh, for example, oxygen is going to give off your greens and reds. Nitrogen gives off blues and purples. We have examples of both in this uh, image here. All right, in this video, we summarize the major layers of our atmosphere. Hopefully the next time you look up at a blue sky, you understand the true complexity of the system that you're observing, even if you can't necessarily see all of those things going on with the naked eye. Our atmosphere is a thin and fragile envelope above the surface, and yet it's protected life on the planet for billions and billions of years. It's certainly worth protecting ourselves now. Hopefully you all have a good rest of your day, and thanks for watching.